everybody and welcome to tonight's webinar. I am so happy that you could join us here tonight. My name is Sam Anderson. I'm a teacher trainer for C2 Education and I've been working, you know, as a teacher for over 10 years working with students, helping them on things like the PSAT, the SAT and the ACT and, and, and schoolwork and everything really associated with that. And you know, now I sort of help work with our teachers so that they can do the same thing. <clears throat> so tonight we're going to be talking about the PSAT. You're really sort of how to look at the score reports. Also, we're going to look a bit at um, you know, a bit at what sort of the next steps are. What do you do with those score reports once you get them, <clears throat> right? Once you get the score reports, how do you read them? What do you do? What's the next step? And how those PSATs, how the PSATs connect both to the National Merit Scholarship as well as to the SAT and the ACT also. You know, because that's always going to be the next step. So <clears throat> with that, right, we're going to sort of start by again just sort of going through the score report from beginning to end. Then we're going to look at the National Merit Scholarship. We're going to look at the PSAT and again sort of how to put your plan together. And then we're going to sort of look at the SAT, you know, the PSAT, what are the, some of the differences, the similarities between them. And then we're also going to bring in the ACT because we're going to really talk about the next steps after you take your PSAT. So looking at the score report, right? So you all get your score report after you take your PSAT if your school is offering it, right? You will take it. Now, in terms of what matters, what really matters in terms of the college application process is your SAT and ACT score. After your GPA, they are the most important factor when it comes to college admissions and admission decisions. But it doesn't mean the PSAT scores don't matter. They don't affect college admissions, right? Colleges don't look at it, they don't receive, they don't care about your PSAT scores. But that doesn't mean that they're not important, right? What they are very useful besides the very, very prestigious National Merit Scholarship they are also a great way of really sort of getting a benchmark, seeing where you are in the SAT, ACT standardized testing process, right? Really sort of saying, okay, I got a whatever score it is that you happen to get on the PSAT. I got this, you know, where do, what would I do on the SAT or on the ACT? We're going to talk a bit more about what that means in a little while um, and, and sort of how they all connect. But... Some sort of basic one, right? Usually, PSAT scores actually come out in sort of two ways. One, they send them to your school, right? The school administers the test, um, and therefore they actually receive the scores first. That usually comes around the first week of December, right? It comes usually very early on in December, first week or so. Now, some schools, depending on the school you go to, depending on the area you're in, sometimes they will, you know, once they receive the scores, they'll tell you your scores. They'll hand a piece of paper. They will you know, give you, you know, maybe they'll, they'll have a printout, they'll, they'll write it down or, or whatever it may be. However they decide to give it to you, they, they, you know, they will if they want to. Otherwise, students, if you go on your college board account, you will get access to your scores usually around the 10th to the 12th sometimes. It, you know, it depends on, you know, where those dates fall. Um, and also, you know, where you are in the region. They don't necessarily send all the, the scores out once. They sometimes do it region by region. Now, if you do need to look at your score and you do want to look at your score, right, you get it back. Obviously, I, I want to know what it is. I want to know how well I did. Go to PSAT.org, you know, backslash my score, create a student account, um, and this will and this will will allow you to look at your scores. It's not necessarily a college board account. They do link to a College Board account, so if you do decide to take the SAT later on, you can then use that as well. But you actually just go to you know, PSAT.org, my score, and you can create your account there and look at your scores then. So if you know it's getting close to that December 10th, December 12th range, and you haven't done so yet, I do highly recommend that you do that. Now, this is what your score report is going to look like. It's going to be very, very sort of straightforward, right? You're going to have your evidence-based reading and writing. You're going to have your math score. And in the middle, you're going to have your total score, which is a sum of the two put together, right? You take your evidence-based reading and writing, you add them together, and your math score, you add them together, that gives you your total score. Now, as you'll notice here, right, evidence-based reading and writing is from 160 to 760, same for the math, which makes the total go from 320 to 520. You know, very <clears throat> straightforward. Now, the other thing that you will notice is this sort of sliding thing. This is a college readiness benchmark. Now, 
the college readiness benchmark on the SAT, they are actually very, very clear about. And it's very similar for the PSAT as well. The benchmark, if you make the benchmark on the SAT, that is about the equivalent of a student who would get about a C, C plus in a college level class. Right? Now, I don't know about you, but most of the students I ended up working with, C plus, uh, that was not nearly good enough. So you really do have to make sure that you do better, you know, a lot better. We're going to talk about that in, in a little while because there's a lot more of those benchmarks throughout the whole sort of score report. So again, pretty straightforward, right? Evidence-based reading, math, added together, gives you your total score. You have those benchmarks in it as well. Now, they are very clear. The PSAT and the SAT are on the same scale. Okay, what does that mean if they're on the same scale? What that means is that the College Board, when they redesigned the SAT, they redesigned the entire, what they called the SAT suite of assessments. And when they redesigned it, they decided to design it with this vertical score scale in mind, meaning that a score on a PSAT in 10th, 11th, even 8th and 9th grade, right? They added a PSAT 8 and 9. A score on any one of those tests would translate to an identical score on another test. So if you get a 700 in math, you do a phenomenal job in math, you get a 700 in math on the PSAT in 11th grade or 10th grade. That means that if you had taken the SAT on the exact same day, that you should get a 700 in math then too. Vice versa for reading. If you get a 500 in reading and writing, that means that if you had taken the SAT on the exact same day, you would get a 500. Same thing goes for the PSAT 89 for those eighth, ninth graders who are taking that or have heard of it or are taking practice tests in it. That means if you get a 400, 450, whatever it is in a particular section or score, that is what you should be getting had you taken the SAT on the exact same day. This is the concept behind this new SAT suite of assessments that every t score lines up and is really equatable and judgeable. And that's one of the things that makes the PSAT such a great benchmark, such a great sort of where do I stand on the SAT world test because of this vertical score scale. Now, that's not the only thing, right? You know, the idea being, of course, that, you know, you obviously want to do great on the PSAT as well, right? You want to make sure you nail the PSAT. So they do put a, how do you compare? They do put a percentile mark as the national rank, right? So what your percentile is in the entire nation for both each individual section and for the score as a whole, right? So that way, if you want to sort of see, okay, all right, I get it, I get it. I got a, you know, an 860 or I got a 480 in math. That's what I would probably get on the SAT. Well, but how do I compare to everyone else? How do I compare to people you know, across the country or people in the next you know, school district over? How do I compare it to them? That's what the percentile is right for. Now, is it incredibly important? It's useful, again, mainly for the National Merit Scholarship, right? You want to be a very high percentile for the National Merit Scholarship. But otherwise, again, schools don't necessarily see this. But it's still very good to see, all right, I want to go to a top tier school. I want to go to a school that this percentage of students get in. Well, if this percentage of students get in, I really need to be in the top something percent to get into that school. And so it gives you really a sense of where your goals are, what you're trying to aim, and really where you stand at that point of time. Now, after that, after that front page, they have what they call the College and Career Readiness Benchmark. Or basically what they do is they break down those two macro sections. They break down the evidence-based reading and writing into a reading and then a writing and language score that are both out of 38, right? And if you take the two 38s, add them together, that makes 76, put a zero, that's your 760. And they, of course, have the math section, which is just doubled and added a zero to it, right? Now, those are also very, very useful to keep an eye on, right? And again, just like before, right, they have sort of approaching benchmark, you meet or exceed the benchmark. And again, those benchmarks are based on that, again, that C plus from the SAT. It may not be exact, because that is what they say for the SAT, but it's probably around that area. Now, 
these are really, really useful, especially because sometimes, and I see this all the times, especially in reading and writing, which would, are put together to give you that evidence-based reading and writing score. Sometimes students do a lot better on one section than the other, right? Sometimes they, I, I've seen students that have like an 18 in reading, but they have a 28 in writing and language, or it's the other way around. And it really can give you a sense, and we're going to talk about this in a little while, on what it is that you really should be looking for and working towards in terms of the macro skills, right? Okay, do I need to work on reading or do I need to work on writing more? Do I need to work on math more than reading and writing? Like, what is the order of those three things that I should be doing? Then the next thing they have is this crossed test score. Now, one of the things the SAT did, you know, is that they added in science and history, social studies stuff throughout the entire T of the test, right? They added in science passages into the reading section, history passages into the reading section, history passages, science passages into writing, charts, graphs, tables, both using historical data as well as scientific data into the math, right? So they put in a bit more information. They put science and history throughout the entire test. And so they give you this cross test score, right? Because it's it's what your score is across all three of the reading, writing, and math tests. How you are doing in terms of the history stuff and how you are doing in terms of the science. And again, very, very useful when it comes down to sort of really figuring out what it is that you're trying to do, trying to accomplish, where it is that you need to work. And the last sort of major part are these subscores, which are broken down even further into the sections, right? So reading could have command of evidence, words and context, and expression of ideal questions all inside of it, right? Writing and language could have words and context, expressions of idea, standard English conventions, even possibly evidence in there. So there's smaller subskills that fit into those bigger test scores, right? And all of them are scored on a scale from 1 to 15. And again, all of them have that need to strengthen approaching benchmark or meets or exceeds that benchmark. And all of this put together can give you a really good sense of where it is that you stand and, and what it is that you're strong in, and what it is that you're weak in, right? So, but again, regardless of any of that, you need to make sure that if you are really hoping to either excel or get into those high tier schools, you need to vastly exceed whatever those benchmarks are. Don't just be happy with just being in the green. You want to be at the end, the far right side of the green. Now, the other thing that you usually get back with the PSAT is you usually get back your question level feedback. Okay, and what this is, is it gives you the question, the correct answer, whether you got it correct or not. If you got it correct, you will see your answer as a check mark. If you got it incorrect, you will see the answer you put down with highlighted in red. A difficulty level from one to three. And then if it falls into any subscore, so if you can see, right, if you look at question number two in the reading, it says COE, command of evidence, right? <clears throat> number two, in, in in, in writing a language could, is two parts, right? It's EOI, expression of ideas and command of evidence, right? So you might have things that are multiple sections and put together and really breaking this down, you can really see what it was that you worked, you know, struggled on. Maybe you made some careless mistakes. And maybe you made some careless mistakes and you just need to fix a couple things here and there. So when you put this together with all the information, all the data, all the subscores, it can really give you a sense of really where your areas are of struggle. All right? Because the first one, the subscores can give you an idea of what codes it is that you want to look for. Right? WIC, words and context, SEC, standard English conventions, you know, HOA, heart of algebra, right? They're all pretty straightforward, right? Because they're all like three phrase things. Um, and you can sort of look at that. And when you do that, it can give you a sense of really what the next thing to do. So what do you do next? Well, the first thing obviously you want to do when you get your scores is actually look at them, right? Review your scores. Take everything that I've been saying, going through that entire score report and identify the patterns and connections. So we're actually going to do this. We're going to do this for our little sample student before, right? We ha sort of had that little guy before, you know, the guy with the 860. Eight, eight, we're going to take a look. We're going to really sort of break down what his scores, what it is that he needs to work on, what his concerns are, and really sort of crafting a plan for him. And you can use the same pattern for your own at home, right? So. Here's the subscores, right? Now, when you review your scores, you don't necessarily want to look at just the big ones, right? Oh, I did worse on math. I need to work on math a lot more. I knew did worse on evidence-based reading and writing. No, break it down. 
Go down to the small things. Take a look at the sub scores. Take a look at the test scores. Take a look at the cross test scores and really see what the connections are here, right? So if you look at this student, right, he did particularly weak in reading specifically command of evidence questions, right? Evidence based questions and a little weaker in science. So if I had to sort of make an assumption based on what I see here, most likely I'm going to say that this student really needs to work on, ev you know, finding and, and working with evidence in science reading passages, right? You know, and that's very highly specific, but it allows you to take multiple pieces, right? I could have also said something like, well, he needs to work on, you know, expression of ideas in science-based reading passages, right? Because he also did poorly on expression of ideas, but we're just gonna look at the first one, right? So when you review your scores, really try to find the connections. And when you lay it out, don't just say, oh, I need to work on commanded evidence. Oh, I need to work on, passport to advanced math. Oh, we need to work on math or reading or writing. Get specific. Be as specific as you can. The more sort of targeted you can be, especially you have time, right? You take this in junior year. You don't have to take your SAT, your ACT until much later on. Use this time to really sort of hone in, spend the time working on it. You know, whatever those skills are, and you can be specific. You can take it down. You can say, okay, I need to work on finding and working with evidence in science reading passages, right? Maybe take out a you know, subscription to Scientific American or something along those lines so you can really work with it. You know? But when you review your scores, really review it. Then, right, all right, you've already said to review your scores, right? You look at the patterns, look at the connections, then go over the problems you got wrong, right? Go back to that score report and really try the problems that you get wrong, you know, because, and, and one of the big mistakes, sort of a sidebar here, one of the big mistakes a lot of people make, a lot of people sort of, is they kind of ignore the questions that they get right. They get a question right, oh, I don't have to worry about that anymore, I'm good. Maybe you got it right, maybe it was an easy question. Maybe it was a, a tough question, you got it right, but it took you a while. Don't ignore the questions you get right. Try them again, try some of the ones, especially if you struggled with them, especially if it, if it took you a lot of time an effort, right? You want to make it faster, you want to make it easier. These are time tests. Try them again. Review any problem that you struggled with, right or wrong. Review all the questions you get wrong. And maybe even take a look at some of the questions that, you know, were easy to do, but maybe you weren't so strong on the concept of, right? So obviously the best way of doing this is if you just grab your answer, see, you know, cover up the correct answers. Don't necessarily erase them so that you can't see them. Cover up the correct answer and try them again, right? Try them again and do yourself a favor and like do something like mark whether it was a careless mistake, whether it was something you struggled on. I don't know, maybe it's like C for careless. You put on the, the left of it. Hard, H for hard, um, you know, D for don't know. Um, you know, if there's a question you skipped or you guessed on, like, I don't know this, you know, make some sort of codes that when you go through and revise, you're keeping notes, you're keeping track of what it is. If there are particular problems that you struggle with, look at that subscore, look at that cross test, see what they are. Maybe some of the harder problems were on those command of evidence. Maybe some of the, what, a lot of the ones you were very careless on were command of evidence. And so maybe command of evidence isn't as big a concern as that expression of ideas was. But when you go through, really pay attention to what it is you're struggling with, what it is you're being, you're making careless mistakes. Because also, if you're making careless mistakes, often topics that we make careless mistakes on once, we're gonna make careless mistakes on again. So you wanna keep an idea on what it is. That, oh, I make a lot of careless mistakes on easy algebra questions. Well, then I wanna make sure I review my algebra so that it's down pat, even with really, really simple questions. All right, so when you go through review it, review everything and really keep track of what it is that you're reviewing. Now. Once you've done that, you've reviewed your scores, reviewed the questions, reviewed everything you've gotten wrong, determine what the next course of action. Now, the next course of action is a little bit sort of challenging, right? The first thing is sort of what do I need to study? What do I need to practice? Now, those are two different things, studying and practice. Studying, right, is a little bit more conceptual. It's really reviewing the content, the material. Practice is, okay, I need more familiarity with this. Maybe these are those careless mistakes, right? So figure out what do you need to study? What do you need to practice, right? Now, how you do this can be broken into a couple different things. It could be broken into content, something like, okay, I don't know my grammar rules. I don't know punctuation. I don't know how to use a semicolon, right? I spent my entire life just doing semicolons based on whatever Microsoft Word tells me to do, 
or Grammarly or, or whatever it is that you use to, to, to grammar check your, your writing. Maybe you don't know exactly how to use a semicolon or a comma, right? What a run on is, how to recognize a run on. However, though, sometimes it's also testing skills, timing, reading strategies, <clears throat> you know, ways to approach different problems so that you are not, you know, dealing with words and context questions. Besides just learning a ton of different vocabulary, right? What do you need to study? Break it down to those. Do I want to, what content do I need to know and what skills do I need to practice? Now, when you're done with that, once you determine sort of what the things are that you need to do, you obviously have to build your plan. Build your plan as a timeline. <clears throat> don't just do it by day. Don't just say, okay, I need to study this today. Do every day, every week, every month that you have. And again, be specific on the areas that you want to focus on. The deadlines that you have, right? When do you want to do certain things by? When you're going to take a practice test? Anything along those lines. Make sure you put it into that <clears throat> plan so that you are completely set up and ready to go. So when you do that, when you have it, don't forget to put in a full length time practice test every once in a while. Like you shouldn't do it every week or every day, right? You are not going to learn by just taking practice test after practice test after practice test. You want to space them out. You want to make sure that you use them and then go back to the top again, right? Once you've taken that practice test, go back to the top. Review those scores, review what you got wrong, determine the next course of action, build your plan that way. So <clears throat> this is a sample for you know a, a student, right? A uh, student taking it on March 9th of 2019, right? Maybe that's when they're taking their SAT. So, and week one, they're going to focus on three particular things, right? They're not going to try to do the entire math section or the entire reading section. No, they're focused on three things. Finding evidence questions, word choice and writing, right? What's the right word to put into that sentence? And then multivariable equation. Week two, right, they're going to look at author's purpose. Punctuation, then they're going to do some timing stuff, right? Some timing drills. Week three, they're going to focus on annotating. Cross elimination, right? That's a strategy. Non calculator problems, content. Week four, maybe, you know, a month in, a month into this thing, they're going to take their first practice test. And then, you know what? They're going to go back. They're going to reassess. They're going to see what they got wrong, what they still need to work on, what they've done better on, what topics have, you know, maybe they were a little bit fuzzier on than they thought originally. They have to, to brush it up again, right? I'm going to recess and readjust. So after every single time you take a practice test, make sure you go through this process again. All right. Always make sure you go through it. Don't just assume that the plan you made back, you know, a month ago is going to hold true three months from now. Right. Always be reevaluating, reassessing, readjusting the plan. <clears throat> that is what you want to make sure you do with your scores. When you get that score report, really try to do this, really try to set up, set yourself up, build a plan, review everything so that you are ready to go because if you want the PSAT, if you want the National Merit Scholarship, it is tough. So let's talk about the National Merit Scholarship. Let's talk about what it is, what the PSAT is used for, and all that kind of stuff. So the first thing that happens, when you get your, P your 11th grade PSAT back, you get a selection index. The selection index is a combination of the reading, writing, math test scores, right? Those 18 to 38 parts, not the 180 to 780. 760 stuff, 18 to 38, all right? And it is a sum of those, and then it is doubled, okay? That is your selection index, all right? And it's right there, right? The selection index that doubles the score of some of your reading, writing, and math test scores. Now, when that happens, that selection index is how the entire process is based on. Based on your selection index, you will either be eligible or you will meet the entry requirements. OK. If your score is not high enough, you will not even be considered for the program at all. Now, it is important to know that just because you have meet, met the entry requirements, that does not mean you are going to get one. OK, because. As you can see in the next line down, right, the only 50,000 now. In terms of the scholarships that are actually available, there is the General National Merit Scholarship, which is about $2,500 scholarship, which I know doesn't seem like a lot of money, but trust me, and I'm sure every parent here will agree, money is great when it comes to college, right? But then on top of which, when you are put into this pool, you are also eligible for corporate-sponsored merit scholarships, which are often awarded by companies based on their own criteria and may use the PSAT as well. Right. Sometimes that is based on a particular company that you 
a family member, your parent that work for, right? <clears throat> or maybe just one that happens to have a headquarters in your town that may be offering one to local schools, right? And then there are also college sponsored merit, merit scholarship awards that are again, sometimes based on your PSAT. All of them fall under this sort of the National Merit Association that is doing this. Now, going back to what we said before, qualifying, right? 50,000 people qualify. We'll go down to a bit nitty gritty pieces after that, right? The scores that it takes to qualify and the scores that it are the cutoff for that 50,000 for that semifinalist, et cetera, are different by state and are you know different state to state and are different year to year. I cannot tell you for 100% certain what your particular state is going to have, right? A lot of times they are going to range usually between 218 to about 224, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes they'll go up to 226 or sometimes they'll have one maybe a little bit lower, 216. But they're usually in that the high teens, low 20s, you know, mid low 20s. But that again depends on the state, right? States with, you know, like a New York or a California are going to have much higher requirements than, you know, states you know, in the middle of the country. So the best thing I could recommend that you guys do, if you are at all competitive for this, right? If you are all interested in this, even if you're not even competitive, even if you're just interested in what this is, I highly recommend looking online to see what some of the recent cutoff scores were, you know, have been over the years for your state. You can usually just do a Google search of just PSAT, you know, cutoff scores, 2000 and whatever, 2018, 2017, 2019, 2016, whatever year it is that you're trying to find, you know, again, I would recommend looking at more than one year so you can see what the trend is. Is it always increasing? Is it about the same year to year? Look online for that, <clears throat> right? And it can give you a sense of what it is and how to qualify, right? So in terms of what it is that we are doing, right? Again, they said before, 1.5 to 1.6 million students enter the pool that hit that cutoff, that first qualifying score. Of that, only 50,000 qualify for recognition. 50,000 qualify for recognition. It is important to know, 50,000 do not get scholarships, okay? Now, of those, 34,000 are commended, meaning they are not semifinalists. They might be eligible for some of the other scholarships, but they are not eligible for the big National Merit Scholarship. Of those 50,000, only 16,000 become semifinalists. Of those 16,000 semifinalists, 15,000 become finalists. Yes, there's a very small cutoff from semifinalist to finalist. All right? A lot of times it's a paperwork-based thing. Um, in order to become a finalist, or once you become a semifinalist, you have to fill in an application. You have to, you know, submit an essay and all that kind of stuff. Of those 15,000 finalists, half of them are given the award. Um, so out of 1.5 to 1.6 million students in 11th grade who take the test, 7,500 is all they get the, the award. That's very, very small. So it's very competitive. And that's why those, those numbers are so high. Huh? To give you an idea, the number itself, the, the total number, only goes up to 228. That is the max. That is the highest possible selection index you can have is 228. So those numbers at 218 to 224, that's very, very high. So you need to be very, very, you know, successful and prepared for this test if you're aiming for this National Merit Scholarship, which again, is very prestigious, still money for your college application, which is always great and, and, and does look good on a college application. Now, of those, of the people, again, those commended the semifinalists, there are some who, again, receive special scholarships. And again, that could be a different types. They could have their own criteria in them. They are not given to finalists. Um, more importantly, they could be given to semifinalists, but they are not given to finalists. Now, if you are, if you are lucky enough to become one of those wonderful 16,000 semifinalists, you have a couple of criteria you do have to meet in order to make it. And again, that's what one of the things that drops down from semifinalist to finalist. One, you have to complete the application. This is actually, a lot of people say this is one of the ones that really gets a lot of people. A lot of people don't realize that there is an application 
for the National Merit Scholarship. It is not just an automatic thing. You have to actually submit an application. In that application is an essay. Not only do you have to have the application and the essay, you have to maintain great GPA, strong academic performance throughout all of school. Not just in freshman, sophomore year, in junior year, early senior year. The award isn't actually given until much, much, after, much, much later after the test. It takes time for this process to go through. So you need to have a strong academic performance throughout the whole time. You need to have a school official, a guidance counselor, a principal, officially endorse you, write a letter of endorsement for you to have it. Now, most school officials are more than happy to do that, right? National Merit Scholarship semifinalists also look great for the school. So that's usually not the biggest challenge, but you do have to remember to ask them. Do keep in mind, remember that a lot of these scores do go to the school first so that, you know, a lot of times those school officials will have a good sense of who some of the, some of the people who might be eligible for those are. But don't rely on that. Make sure you go ahead and ask them if you do find out that you are a semifinalist. And you also need to actually take the SAT or the ACT. And you need to actually do excellently on them. Now, what that is, they're not entirely clear about, but you need to score well. You'll probably not score quite as well as you in the PSAT, but you can't get like a 1500 on the PSAT and get 1100 on the SAT and then expect that to equate. No, you need to score strongly. Be in that top set of percentiles for the SAT or the ACT. And the ACT is actually a new thing. College Board actually recently announced that they would allow the ACT to be used as well as the SAT for the National Merit Scholarship. All right? That they would take those. Not College Board, the National Merit Scholarship Foundation. All right. There, they you know decided, okay, there's enough people taking the ACT. Yeah, we'll take that as well. It used to just be the SAT. But you have to make sure you perform well. So, again, using that PSAT as prep, as a, an ability to repair for that SAT or ACT is so critical for that reason. Right? That it does allow you to really sort of set yourself up so you can get those excellent SAT or ACT scores that you need to become that finalist to get that award. Now, because I just said that, because of the fact that you do need those strong SAT and those strong AC or those strong ACT scores, I thought it'd be a good idea to sort of take a look at the three tests and sort of how they connect. Now, the first one, the sort of more obvious ones to look at is, of course, how do the PSAT and the SAT sort of integrate? Now, we sort of talked about this before, right? There are three versions of the PSAT. There's the PSAT NMSQT or PSAT National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. There's the PSAT 10, which is identical, literally identical to the PSAT NMSQT. They are the same tests. They're just different names because they are given at different times. But difficulty, questions, et cetera, they are the same test. And then there's the PSAT 8 and 9, which is given to 8th and 9th graders. And again, has a slightly different scaling. It goes from 120 to 720 rather than 160 to 760 per section. But regardless of the test that you take, the PSAT and the SAT are almost identical except for a couple things. Now, for the purposes of this, we're really only going to talk about the PSAT 10, 11, slash NMSQT, and the SAT. PSAT 8, 9, a little bit different, might be another day. So, PSAT, how do they connect? In math, multiple steps per problem. All right, PSAT 10, PSAT 11, usually two, three, sometimes four steps to solve a problem. SAT, there is a strong emphasis on multi-step problems. That is very common in both of these tests, all right? Both of them use geometry, concepts of reasoning, right? Spatial reasoning, right? Not heavily, right? It's not, a, it's not like 50% of the test is geometry, but they're both in there. Both of them use it, both of them use the concepts and the ideas behind it. PSAT, right, it does bring in that algebra too. Linear exponential growth, right? Expo exponents a lot of times not taught until algebra two sometimes. You know, early pre-calculus, usually algebra two though. They, they bring those in. SAT brings in statistics, mean, median, mode, right? You know, statistical analysis, slope, deviation, all that kind of stuff is on the SAT. But again, very similar. Right? Again, that high level problem solving algebraic. Both of them use trigonometry. Right? PSAT, really, that's sort of the cap. Where, you know, again, there's that 
small differences. The PSAT is a shorter test than the SAT in math. And those questions they, they've sort of removed are a lot of the very complex pre-calculus material that show up on the SAT. Complex numbers, you know, advanced equations. Really, they just bring you up to trigonometry when it comes to PSAT 10 to PSAT 11. But otherwise, right, they're very similar. Very similar, both multi-step problems, reasoning, logic, high levels of algebra, and some pre, you know, some early trig pre-calc stuff. Now, the reading, reading is, is is very very close, right? Inferences on both. Sometimes now the difference is right. Maybe the SAT might have a few more steps. You have to look at a few more parts of the passage to draw the inference. But both of them have inferences. Both of them have drawn conclusions. Both of them use based on complicated relationships, right? Sometimes connecting multiple texts together, right? Where you have two texts and you have to sort of see, okay, how does this person think about what this person said? What do you think they'd say, right? Both of them, and this is a big thing that came with the SAT, use charts and graphs in the reading passages where you have to take the passage and connect it to information in a chart and graph. That's on the PSAT, that's on the SAT, that's in both of them. In writing, Again, very similar, punctuation on both, editing sentences, compound, complex, challenging sentences, it's in them, right? And again, graphs, charts from text to graph, both of them, in both the PSAT and in the SAT. It is on both tests. So as you can see, these tests are fundamentally similar between the two. However, there is one difference. There is no essay on the PSAT. On the SAT, there is an essay where basically what they do is they give you a passage and then they ask you to write an essay where you explain how they support the author of that essay supports their argument. Okay. It is an analytical essay. It is a challenging essay. It is optional at most schools. But that does not mean that it's not recommended. And recommended usually means do it. So it's good to know, but it is important to know that it's not on the PSAT. So if you take the PSAT, go into the SAT with the essay, you're not gonna be prepared for the essay. So you wanna make sure you spend some time getting used to that, seeing what that essay is like, all right? And very important for that essay, if you do decide to take it, do not decide whether you agree or disagree with the author. That is not what they are asking. They are just simply asking you to understand how they write. It's a how essay, not a what essay. They're not asking you to talk about what the author is saying, but rather how they are saying it. Now, the SAT and the ACT. You've taken the PSAT. National Merit Scholarship takes both tests. How do you know which one you want to take? Well, at the end of the day, they're very similar. The reading the writing tests are pretty much similar. They are use the exact same skills. They you know, both have grammar questions, they both have stylistic revision questions, they both have rhetoric questions. It's in both tests. There's slight differences in emphasis and there's noticeable differences in timing, which we'll talk about in a bit. But overall, right, they're very similar, the reading and writing. Now, we talked before about how the SAT had analyzing charts and graphs in the reading and in the writing section. They really have charts and graphs throughout all, all four sections. They have it in both math sections, they have it in the writing section, they have it in the reading section. The ACT has an entire fourth section on science. It's not really science. It's more like analyzing charts and graphs um, with scientific information. They have a lot of charts and graphs in that science section, but they also do put it in on the math section as well. So you have to sort of keep that in mind with that too. That it's not just, oh, if I don't want to deal with charts and graphs in math, I should take the ACT. No, it's also charts and graphs are on both tests in the math section. The difference is where are the reading parts of the charts and graphs. ACT sticks all their reading-based science charts and graphs in the ACT science section. SAT sticks in both the reading and the writing section. But, so, given that we said that, there are some differences. There's a lot of similarities in terms of the reading, the writing, and in the charts and graphs, but obviously the remaining three pieces are slightly different. One, SAT in math has a no calculator section. There are two math sections. One has no calculator, one has calculator. Also the same for the PSAT. ACT though, permits a calculator on the entire test. All right, science, SAT. We talked before how the PSAT had that cross test score in analysis and science. The reason why is because they put science material throughout 
the entire test. They have science in the reading, science in the writing, science in the math. It is science context, not content. You don't need to know bio or chem or physics to do the SAT. You also don't need to know it for the AC, ACT. You don't need to know your bio, your chem, your physics for the ACT. It is a dedicated science test, meaning science context, analyzing experiments, reading data off of charts and graphs, not necessarily remembering what the equilibrium equation is or what photosynthesis is or what Newton's first law is. You don't need to necessarily know that stuff for the ACT science section. And the last and, and really major difference is the essay. <clears throat> the SAT is a passage analysis versus the ACT is a persuasive argument. You are, on the SAT, you are really sort of analyzing how an author is writing something versus the ACT, you are trying to convince the audience of your point of view, which is a noticeable difference. So there are some differences, but the big, big, big picture differences are noticeable. SAT. As a whole, less content, and math is a clear example, there is much, much smaller amount of geometry on the SAT than there is on the ACT. So there is less content, there's much more algebra focus. But the content that they test you on, they really want you to delve deeply, to understand the problem, to analyze it. ACT, more material, but less. It's much more sort of, <clears throat> you know, solve these problems, answer these questions. The reason, you know, they're a little bit simpler, so to speak, a lot of times. Um, maybe a few less steps on the math problem, a few less sort of connections to make in reading and writing. You know, one of the great analogies for it, I always sort of heard, you know, like one of the big complaints, right, you always got those, I, I heard a lot of complaints from students about how their tests weren't like their homework, right? The tests always had more challenging, complex questions than their homework had. And so in many ways, the ACT is like, the homework, right? A lot of work, much more straightforward, less deep, less intense, less critical thinking. The SAT is like those in-school tests. Now, that doesn't mean that that's, oh, I, I hate my in-school test. I'm going to do the ACT. There are some offsets to that because the biggest, utter bigger, biggest difference between the two tests is the pacing. The SAT is a marathon. There is more question Sorry, more time per each question, right? Each question you can take more time to do that critical analysis, to do that review, to do that analysis. The S ACT is a series of sprints. It's four sections that are fast. Sometimes you have almost 30 seconds per question versus the SAT, nothing is under a minute. That's not true. Writing. But even still, the writing, it's, it's like a difference of 15 seconds per question for the two, right? The ACT is like 36 seconds per question. The SAT is like 50. So there is a noticeable difference in timing, even on the, sh the shortest passages, right? The ACT is much faster. So if you struggle with timing on a test, that might you know, change up how you do it. But what we do recommend, what we do say, and when you really think through what question you should take, there's a couple things to know. One, colleges don't care. They'll take either test. They'll take the SAT, they'll take the ACT. It used to be that, you know, the Midwest, the middle of the country, that was the bastion of the ACT and the coast were the SAT. Not anymore. Colleges don't have a preference because College Board and the ACT.org or the ACT organization, they created a concordance table that allows that colleges and, and anybody really to easily convert and compare scores between the two because your goal your utter goal is to submit the test that you are going to get your highest score it doesn't matter whether you're you like one better at the end of the day you want to take and submit the test that you do the best in and so because of that practice both take a practice test in both tests Take an SAT practice, take PSAT, sort of works as that. Take an ACT practice test. Try taking both tests and see which one you do better in. Because when you get down to it, it really comes down to this, right? Based on how it is you are, right? If you do better on the SAT and you're more comfortable with it, do the SAT. If you do better on the SAT and you don't care which one, go with the SAT, right? If you do the SAT, you like the ACT a little bit better, 
really comes down to your time frame, right? In general rule of thumb, this, as you can see, if you look at the top right and bottom left corners, if you are slow on time, stick with whatever test you do better with. End of story. If you have time, on the other hand, you can try prepping for the one that you like better. But always sort of keep the other one going, right? Maybe do a little practice problem, maybe every once in a couple months or something like that. Try out another practice test in the the test that maybe you don't like as much, but you tend to do better at, right? So if you're doing better on the SAT, but you like the ACT more, you like the, the faster pace, you like the simpler questions, feel free to prep for the ACT, but pull in some SAT stuff as well. There's nothing saying that you can't. Again, reading, writing, even some of the math and science are, are very similar to each other in context and stuff. And so you can pull material from both tests to sort of practice and prep for. But when in doubt, always go with whichever one that you do better in, right? Unless you have a lot of time and you have a very strong preference for the other. But always keep that in mind. And if you're still confused, if you're still sort of going, all right, uh, I have no idea. I got my PSAT scores. I have no idea how to make this plan. I have no idea, you know, which tests I could take. Feel free to come visit one of uh, our C2 centers. We have them all over. All of our Center directors are experts on sort of helping you determine which test is better for you. They're also great at putting together plans. Not only do they put together plans, we also have something where we automatically, remember I talked about that, you know, review and revise. We have, you know, interim tests with a review and revise where we sit down and we review and revise your plan with you. So if you do have any questions or any more questions that you want to get answered that I didn't answer tonight, or if you want to have a consultation it's free there's no obligation with a local center director please at the end of this there will be a survey that will pop up it will ask you if you want um, such a sort of conversation connection if you do please say yes please leave me your name a phone number or email that i can reach you at and then your zip code the zip code is incredibly important so that i can make sure i match you with whatever center is closest to you and not send you to one three thousand miles away that'd be bad otherwise Thank you so much for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful night. Um, good luck when you get your PSAT scores back, when you take your PSAT. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope everybody has a wonderful night. Thank you, and good luck.